we usually start with girls and boys and I started off. It's terrifying. And as soon as you start, everything's fine. Literally, you can change the emotion of 50,000 people at your fingertips. And then you get the reaction. And you suddenly go, oh my God, people are listening to me. Okay, welcome to the Stage Left podcast, lifting the veil on the music industry by telling the stories of those with a unique vantage point. This podcast exists to provide free educational content for young musicians entering an increasingly complex industry by telling the stories of some of the unsung heroes behind the success. So go to the stagelefpodcast.com for all episodes featuring musicians who discuss in detail the recording, writing and performing processes of the likes of Elvis Presley, David Bowie, Michael Jackson, The Beatles, Fleetwood Mac, Nick Cave, Oasis, Morrissey, Radiohead, Elbow, The 1975, Bob Dylan, the Stone Roses, Jeff Lynne and Kraftwerk. Our guest today is one of two men to have headlined Glastonbury's Pyramid Stage with two different bands in two consecutive years. First with Blur and then Gorillaz, whilst also playing uh, the role of uh, someone who's been shoulder to shoulder and a trusted compadre for 25 years and right hand man to pretty much anything Damon Albarn cooks up. But today we'll be exploring the job of being musical director for Gorillaz with shows featuring the likes of uh, Snoop Dogg and Marky e. Smith and Sean Ryder, um, working with the groundbreaking drummer Tony Allen, who we sadly lost last year, um, how playing gigs in Syria compare and contrast to other parts of the world and we'll be finding out the burning question on everyone's lips what's the current underground dance movement scene like in Saudi Arabia so it's a pleasure to say that our guest today on the Sage Left podcast is none other than Mike Smith thanks for joining us today Mike how's it going my pleasure Chris thanks for having me it's great to be here hello everybody Good stuff, good stuff. So we aren't going to dwell on coronavirus too much because we were recording this in early January in 2021 and there's lockdown, et cetera, et cetera. But I know a lot of you listeners listen at different times. But I did just want to ask you, Mike, there's been a lot of negativity around coronavirus and rightly so. But what are some of the positives that might have come out of this from a professional element for you? So have you developed any new skills or explored any new musical avenues in the last year or so? I think that, you know, lockdown has created a lot of focus in, in people. Making music is sometimes a solitary pursuit. So in those terms, nothing has much really changed in terms of how I've been making music. It's been an interesting way of collaborating with you know, the musicians and do find that a lot of us have basically sort of built decent home studios so we can actually collaborate over the internet, which seems to be growing anyway. I think potentially that coronavirus has just accelerated this move towards over the internet collaborations and feeding music through. So yeah, I think it's 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 been it's been healthy. The only thing obviously is not doing gigs and interacting with each other mm. personally. That's the one thing that everybody misses and I hope we come back to that very soon. But on the whole, it's it's you know, I've got away with being able to do some interesting things in the last year and yeah, it's been okay. <laughs> it's been okay, yes. It's been okay, just about. Yeah, and we don't know when live gigs are coming back and, and what that might look like when they do. Just out of interest, what's the longest you've gone without playing an instrument or, you know, since you've become a professional musician? Has it been during this period and you've given yourself a break? Or was there another time in your career where you've actually just taken a long time without picking up an instrument? Well, I mean, the one instrument that I've actually come back to and I haven't practised for a long time and played is a saxophone. And the, at the end of last year, I thought, look, you know, let's just get this back into shape. So I've been spending every day practising as i getting my chops back as much as I can because it feels like quite an open-ended situation at the moment. I don't have to, you know, work towards anything. I can just come back to that instrument and it's an open book and there's no real pressure and try and find some enjoyment well I am finding enjoyment from playing it again I mean there's over a year I hadn't played it which is really disgraceful and lots of my friends say what's going on here Mike why aren't you playing your horn Uh, so I've come back to it and apart from the gorillas streams at the end of last year there was about seven months I guess without playing anything live that's the longest time I've ever had Mm. with not doing anything so that's a bit strange, you know, just the, it's half of your life really is playing life, if not more, or from a lot of people, it's everything. And I think I've just adjusted as we all had adjusted. Um, and as you would do if you're a creative artist, you just adjust and, and move in ways that you can. And some of the stuff I think you've been working on 
if my research bunnies have been doing a good job, which is basically myself late at night. Late <laughs> at night. Um, working with Mali musicians and your music supervisor on a documentary around the underground dance scene in Saudi Arabia. Tell us a bit about those, if you can. Yeah, sure. The Saudi Arabian thing was a music producer role I had uh, for the show because it is about the underground dance music scene in Saudi Arabia. And the director wanted a, a Saudi Arabian composer he hadn't done anything in in writing music for documentaries. So it was my job to basically hone his music, which is great, into a shape that works in that genre, documentary music. So that was an interesting process of being kind of on the other side of creating in being and just producing. And in fact, the the Le Vol de Bolly is another project that we did at the Theatre Châtelet in October last year. And that's been a two-year progression of workshopping with Lots of musicians in Paris until COVID hit. We were going out there every few months and trying out different combinations of musicians. And then at the same time, as with all theatrical productions involving music, it's a mixture of the story unfolding and being conveyed and and honing that story, those story elements. And then the musical elements, like we had so many references that come July, we got together, last July, we got together and looked at all the music and by that point the story was much stronger we looked at the the source of the music we had and basically put down a much tighter template if you like a musical template with us the, myself and Remy Kabaka and Damon fleshing out these musical cues these musical ideas in a much more structured form that we could then take to the musicians in France and workshop with them and work it out with them so Le Vol de Bolly was not a score there was no musical score it was all oral and we tried ideas recorded everything every single day made the references delivered the music overnight to the musicians who then referenced it again when we needed to reference and it was a really interesting way of creating the score because we all collaborated on that structure what was what the contents the instruments that we used everybody was on board that process and I've never worked that way before. And I think for a lot of the Malian musicians and the African musicians, it was a mixture of Congolese, mixture of Malian musicians and Western musicians, early music choir. We, I don't think any of them had ever worked in that way before. So watching them, watching that sort of musical style, that musical heritage coming to life within a theatrical framework was really interesting and different. And it's it's a way and a shape of arrangement that I don't think they were familiar with. You know, African music tends to have a long groove. So this was much more nuanced. So people had particular things they had to concentrate on and focus on musically and deliver. So it was seed for your pants stuff, but we, mm-hmm. we got it through. And hopefully it's going to come back in April 22. So nice. in a year's time, we'll be back in Paris and doing a proper run. Fingers crossed. What drives Damon? So he seems so driven yes. like to do so much. It's just how prolific he is in so yes. many different areas that some songs, that are fantastic songs, that sometimes maybe almost slip under the radar. Um, does he just release everything he writes? Like, does he have a folder in his laptop, which is just stuff that was not very good? Because if so, he's just writing 100 songs a year. You know, he's just so, yeah. so prolific. Yeah, I think, for instance, I think probably a good example of any album that he he he, he writes, so with a Gorillaz record or that he'll probably write 20 or 30 demos and then hone down some of those to a long list and flesh out those songs. And then it's back to sort of honing that list down to a decent number for a record. But he he writes every day, you know, he writes music every day. He writes a song a day. He does at least something <laughs> every single day. He has a very strict regime of working from 10 till 6. That's his Monday to Friday Nothing at the weekend. That's his system of work, yeah. He, he obviously really trusts you, you know, to be involved so close in so many projects. You know, he's been ridiculously successful with Blur. Then now you'd probably say that he'd be known going forward as Damon Albarn from Corillas because they're even bigger and Good, the Bad, the Queen, all this other stuff. So what do you think is kind of driving him to get out of bed in the morning? What is he, is he trying to prove something to himself or to someone else? What do you think of the root cause of that drive is? I, I think it's a need. I think it's that like any prolific artist, uh, a painter, visual arts, performance art. It's your life. It's what keeps you going. It's your soul. And I think he, it's a need for him. I think uh, he, he doesn't 
have an alternative. He can't stop himself. I think that's that, that goes for a lot of people who are involved in music are, are greats. You know, it's a need for them. It's 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 essential. It's part of themselves, you know. So as much as some people like to go for a run in the morning or do that thing, it's just part of his daily life. It's just that's what it, he does. Just uh, if he doesn't have that, then what does he have? <laughs> mm. What do any artist have? So I was going to say, have you ever been in uh, sessions with him or used songs for say like the Good, the Bad, the Queen, and then then he's gone? Actually, this would be better for a gorilla. Should we use this for gorillas? Uh, or are they very kind of separate processes? Very separate processes. We sometimes, after a period of time, particularly if we come back to another tour, so potentially another Gorillaz tour, he might want to do the songs in a slightly different way. He's always wanting to explore ways of keeping the songs potentially new and shaping them in a different way. That's, that's pretty much in a Gorillaz fashion we've done that. What motivates you? What motivates you, Mike? Let's say the majority of our listeners are, are musicians, you know, and, and, you know, some of them are well-known musicians, but a lot of them were people who would aspire to headline Glastonbury and all that kind of stuff. Once you've done that, what gets you out of bed in the morning, apart from obviously having to keep a roof over your head? What gets me, what gets me going? Well, I mean, always the, the potential for, for different strands of work that come in. I'm always trying to sort of stretch myself and what, what, what I've got experience in. I think I try and use the skills I've got as much as I possibly can over the years. I've uh, developed new skills and I'm always looking to explore those skills. So, yeah, I mean, there's a number of things. It's either practicing the saxophone, which I'm doing a lot now, or it's sitting down and maybe writing some production music or having an idea for other projects. There's a saxophone quartet I write music for, and we've got a new project we're talking about at the moment that we're developing. So there's always some iron in the fire that, needs looking at and that's what excites me is new things to be doing every day you've got to the the level that a lot of musicians would want to get to both kind of creatively and you know the fact the portfolio stuff but also the excitement of the live gigs and that kind of thing what were the pivotal moments in your youth that you think has enabled that to happen i think a school was my music teacher can you remember his name rex trevitt rest in peace Rex was yeah. a, a crucial part of my life when I was younger, growing up in Bridport and Dorset. He was actually the reason I decided to take up music. Very creative, very interesting character who got me involved in all sorts of things. I got into the National Jazz Orchestra as a saxophone player, so that was a real launch pad. Uh, a very testing, very virtuosic, young, big band, very competitive, and that launched my sort of freelance career in London as a saxophone player. And I was a complete jazz nut, so obviously I was just wanting to play jazz all the time. So I, I got into all sorts of things doing that. Going to the Guildhall School of Music as a postgraduate student, I got involved with Acid Jazz Records when they started. So that was quite a key part of my learning, understanding a bit about the business, learning to arrange for brass, working with a whole host of different musicians and different backgrounds. That was a good, a big learning curve. When I got the chance to play with Blur as a saxophone player, when I did my very first show with them, I thought, this band are the shit, and I think go a long way. <laughs> <laughs> I think I want to be around this, this, this crew for as, as long as possible because it was just so exciting. It was just like nothing else I'd ever performed with. I think that was around 95, is that right? Around I think States. so. Yeah, you know what? I was looking up online. I was trying to find my first gig. And I think it was about 94, maybe, wow. something like that. Yeah. And it, it was just an extreme, extreme experience. So just seeing how far an artist put themselves on the line. You know, this band put themselves on the line creatively and with energy, their, their musical performance. It was just exhausting. To, to, to see, but that they they really give it something, and that was like a, a real step up. And I thought this is this is really good. This is how it should be. So early songs you must have played on sax. I'm guessing Universal, End yeah, of the Century. 
Yes. I think, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so when we had Gail Ann Dorsey on recently, she was talking about working with Bowie and she said that he was an expert at kind of finding the people who kind of plugged a gap in his own knowledge about how to do certain things, basically. Mm. So he was really good at that. Have you kind of reflected and thought, actually, what did I bring to Blur, which you would have done? Like, what did you perhaps bring to the party that some might have overlooked, but actually you think that would have enabled them to do what they wanted to? I think friendship, you know, we became very good friends, Damon and I, over the course of doing Blur and particularly early days. You know, it was just an evolving process of understanding and uh, respect, I suppose, and just being something to sound off. It's like I wasn't, you know, officially part of the band, but I sort of had an opinion and it was listened to, you know, so whether it was a set list thing or, or, or how the horns were arranged. I was really only playing sax with Blur and and the section at the time when we were doing The Great Escape was a four piece section. But then it got whittled down to two. We did a festival tour of the States and it was just myself and Richard Sibbard, the trumpet player. Uh, and we ended up, I think sometimes, we only played one song a night. I think we played pop scene and that was it. So, <laughs> And then they recorded 13 and toured that. And there was a long gap where I didn't see Damon or Blur for about a year and a half. And they were off doing the 13 tour. And then I was sitting at home once one evening and I thought, I hadn't spoken to Damon for over a year. I should give him a ring and see what's what's going on. And this was the end of sort of 1999, I guess. And and he said, well, that's great timing. Um, come over, mate, tomorrow. So uh, I've got something I want to play you a new thing new project and that was grillers so he was talking about it being an animated band and they had some songs and they he wanted to put together a band he said i've got a guitarist i've got a bass player uh I got a drummer uh, i need a keyboard player and i said well I, I play keyboards you know he said oh yeah god yeah of course jesus so okay well you play keyboards we've got the band the beginning of that, I started playing keyboards. So with that role, it was kind of automatically into a sort of a musical director role that came out of playing keyboards. And therefore I was sort of the, the one who were the ears of, of the band. So I knew every part I could rehearse the band and correct things and would be a guide for how we structured rehearsals. So this was quite a kind of a steep learning curve for me as a horn player, going into a slightly different headspace of how what the role as a keyboard player is with the band. You're playing all the time. You suddenly become fairly official, I suppose, taken a bit more seriously because you play keyboards. And I had musical knowledge of arrangement and orchestration. My theoretical musical knowledge has, came into play. And mm -hmm. then it was about becoming a a band leader, I guess. And I would basically take the band and we would structure the rehearsals. And then and then after the first Gorillaz record, we went into uh, Think Tank with Blur. So I played some sax on that. And then I took over the keyboard job with Blur and I was playing sax and keyboards in that role. So my role with Blur changed and that became... Okay, much closer to the whole way the band sounded. I wasn't mm -hmm. just playing riffs on a saxophone. I was kind of integral playing quite important keyboard parts that had been recorded. So my position changed and my part in the band changed and I became more of a consultory keyboard slash musical director with that. And then after that is kind of taken for granted, you know, in the itinerary, it would be Mike Smith Keyboards MD. So that became my, my role, you know, it was just uh, taken on from that, really. And we've had, if anyone listening to this is interested in the, you know, musical director role, we've had a number of interesting musical directors. We had Spike Edney on, who is Queen's musical director, mm -hmm. and he describes the role quite differently to other people. So, because there is no kind of like job description to a musical director. I just wonder how it works in regards to, so you're structuring the rehearsals. Mm -hmm. I guess you're not choosing set lists. Would that be right? Would that be Damon? Not who, necessarily, no. no. Uh, with with my role in a band like Gorillaz or Blur or The Good, The Bad and The Queen, we have a trio of us who have always worked with Damon. And the three of us are 
done it as long as each other. So there's Matt Butcher, our front of house sound, and then Stu Lowbridge, who initially was a drum technician, but then has moved into kind of music, the music supervisor of the band live. So he would, you know, they would have notes about how the band sounded. And then the two of us would consult on, well, will this work on that sound check? I, I'll go between the production side of the band and the band itself. So if we were told we had a, a limited sound check, I would then organise potentially what we needed to rehearse. What Damon wanted to play and sound check, what Damon wanted to have a look at. If there was a, an issue with, say, the backing vocalist wants to rehearse something, I would be like scheduling what needed to be tackled according to what was not working properly in the time we had. And we would do this on the tour every day. And in rehearsals, when we are rehearsing for a tour, I would be deciding on maybe the length of rehearsals we're going to run, what we're doing that day, and when we're having a break. <laughs> mm. It's not quite the same as being a theatre musical director, which is hard as hell. My experience doing Le Vol de Bolly was, was very different because I was a go-between Damon as the, the music side of thing and also what the director was wanting, what he felt about the music and what he felt about aspects of it and trying to basically bring teams of creatives together so that we are making a productive use of our time. I think with, with, with Gorillaz, it, it's, it's many things. We have featured artists and featured artists might want to do sound checks. They might not want to. We have an hour or two for a sound check and some people might want to rehearse something more and we just have to work that out, you know, but it's a team effort between front of house production and myself delivering what they're hearing and also what are other things that I need to address with the band. It's it's necessary with a band that size. You need somebody who's the, the dictator. I mean, most of the time I'm described as a musical dictator. Ah, interesting. <laughs> well, because my next question, as you were saying that there's so many questions, I bet listeners are doing this as well. I think, gosh, so many questions I want to ask. <laughs> I've written down three that just came from that one answer alone. What's the decision-making process? Like, if, if Damon is the leader of the band, but then, you know, there's other kind of scene, like saying Blur, like, you know, you, they, they're like a brotherhood have been together for so long. What's the what's the dynamic there about who has basically the final say when you have a musical director? And how's that compare to, to Gorillaz? Well, Damon has the final say, and it would be like, well, does that, did that work? Does it work? How we're doing this? And so you kind of think, maybe you should try it like that, and let's try it like that. It's very, very democratic. It's mm. not authoritarian. Damon's not, and he's not like that. It's not that kind of individual. It's it's try things. Let's try things and see if it works. But then, where do you sit in that? If you're the musical dictator, if everyone calls you that, <laughs> where do you sit? Where do you sit in that? Well, I, I articulate it in a musical way. It, it, if someone's talking about something being floaty, we need something oh, floaty nice. there, uh, it, or, or we don't need somebody don't need something of that. Then it would be like I would articulate it musically so people understand yeah that's, that's really clear that makes a lot of sense actually yeah well and you have to you have to really and you have to under i think part of the dynamic of, the, of being someone in my position is a, i'm sure other musical directors are the same is that you be nice you know be firm be nice so all the people that you're working with because they're all great it's about them having a chance to to say what they need to say sometimes i mean i know that uh with with some of the with the gorillas singers we have they'll say can we have a look at this song tomorrow because we're not quite sure about the part here i'll listen to the part they're doing and i can help them articulate that part so you're facilitating as well mm -hmm. as directing you know love it and I, I watched some gorillas footage from a number of tours last night actually and i sat there thinking about as a musical director i thought gosh there's a lot that could go wrong here i just thought, I, do you know what i mean it's just like there's so it just i was on the edge of myself i just thought christ there must be so much that could go wrong because obviously the synchronicity of the the visuals and the lip syncing oh my word so oh, yeah there must be so wrong you must have had some kind of flying by the seats of the pank moments yes but it's very it's interesting you say that line because that's exactly what damon said to me before he put his arm around me before we went on stage at Glastonbury with Plastic Beach Tour we were doing and you two had cancelled because Bono did his back in mm -hmm. and we stepped in and our show it, 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 we hadn't really played it hadn't, we hadn't really honed it and this was like 
God, we're headlining at Glastonbury. We're, we're kind of ready. <laughs> we're kind of ready. But we probably do with like a couple of months touring just to get it really tight to play Glastonbury. So anyway, we were, we were good. But before we went on, he put his arm around me and he said, so much could go wrong. You know, it's like brilliant. Yes. <laughs> Great. Yes, it could. Because we had a lot of musicians on stage, a lot. We had this pocket of Syrian musicians. I mean, we had a lot of people on that tour, big choir, string section. Yeah, the audio visual thing is very complex, but you can't think about it. You really mm -hmm. can't. You just have to trust yourself. You have to trust your yourself to just pull it out of the bag, you know? Do, do you have plans in case things go wrong? Yes. I, I mean, it's a technical thing to talk about, but mm -hmm. things have developed a lot with how shows are run. And we we run our show using Ableton for playback of stuff and sounds that we can't actually physically play. And it also runs our keyboard setup. So MIDI control messages are sent to our keyboards that can change sounds throughout the song and also change what's happening on the, on the electric drum kit. So that's all automated and that's in Ableton. And main stage runs alongside that. And then the video is also a slave to that. So it's all in one thing. My tech, Andy Hanwee, who runs that side of it, has a really big job. But yeah, things like Sean Ryder coming in two bars, two beats, <laughs> two beats early on Dare when we played at Manchester Festival. We couldn't do much about that at that time. We had to go with it. But we got halfway through the song and thought, no, we can't carry on. So we stopped and started the song again. And audiences just love that. They love yeah. a they love a, a mess up on, on, yeah. on a song. We don't obviously, but it happens, and we started again, and it's fine. But nowadays, no, with some occasionally a guest artist or somebody might come in two bars early on on a, on, a, on an intro. Now I, I have a microphone on stage, which is a direct mic to my tech, and also to the band's ears. I have another one, so. I can flip a switch and say, don't worry about it. It's been taken care of. Andy, my tech will move the session so that even if the vocalist is carrying on, we can adjust the arrangement as we go. So we don't stop songs now. We just carry on and things get adjusted on the fly as we play. So it's really, it's, it, it, it's, it's pretty safe. It's pretty, it's pretty safe. I can't really think of anything that's really disaster gone wrong apart from when we didn't have video for our, one of our shows at Harlem Apollo, when we we, we did uh, Demon Days, which was really really sad, but there was a lot of technical situation, a lot of technical issues that we had at Harlem Apollo that I don't think would happen anymore. But yeah, that was that was the only thing really. Just just mm -hmm. go with it. If if you have to play acoustic or you have to play without such and such and such, we get through it. You just face it. You know. So one of my next questions was actually going to be around how do you communicate on stage and, and, and the challenges around that and in a show when it's so you know synchronized with the, the, the screen how much kind of flexibility can be built into a show actually we had uh, we had a guy called Richard Fortas on on who plays lead guitar with uh, Guns N' Roses kind of with Slash well basically when Slash plays he, he goes to rhythm and he said that they're they have the same system as you do and every time there's a guitar solo Axel Rose will tell jokes and say the filthiest thing he could possibly say <laughs> to try and put off the guitarist to make a mistake but obviously the audience can't hear it. Yeah, just wondering with Snoop Dogg and the guests that you had at Glastonbury, was that rehearsed? Did you get a chance to have a rehearsal? Well, no, I didn't think, yeah. With, with Snoop, we uh, there was no rehearsal, but he's just unbelievable, you know. He was, yeah. We'll send a, a version, it's like 16 bars here and do 16 bars there and they will get something in advance if we can't sound check but it's rare that we don't play a show without a guest artist actually rehearsing with us that's very that's very rare but snoop just bowls in and just does it so and and so you had marquee e. smith at the same show as well did yeah. lou reed play that as well is that what, sorry did lou, did lou reed play as well yes lou reed talking? played lou well yeah i mean lou, 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 it was tricky it was hard for lou because when he recorded some kind of nature, he did it in a certain way. And then Damon re kind of edited the song and cut the lyric into, into, into not a different order, but it's slightly 
faster pace and a different where the, where they entered was a different thing. So the arrangement ended up differently, and Lou arrived, and I don't think he really had prepared. Uh, he had a chance to prepare that well. So once he heard it, it was confusing for him. And we spent a long time getting that right. In rehearsal then? Well, with Plastic Beach, we had a lot of guests and the schedule was very tight. How much time do we need with De La Soul? Oh, De La Soul just rinse it. They'll be in and out. And uh, Marky Smith needed a bit of longer time, but it was free form, you know. You, Damon was very, with Marky Smith, it was a kind of a, a, a free delivery of what he wanted to say. It didn't matter so much with Mark because we just had a groove and he could just do literally what he wanted mm. over it and trying not to, you know, turn, turn all the amps up and behaving on stage was tr tricky with Mark. But Bobby, Bobby was fantastic. Bobby Womack, you know, we, we, he, he needed a bit of ex extra rehearsal, and his health wasn't 100%, so we had to be very careful about Bobby and, and, and his, his time that he, he would rehearse with us. But in the end, you know, Bobby was just amazing. I mean, once you got it, you got it. You know, it, mm. our shows were pretty much the same, particularly Plastic Beach. We, we got the set after Glastonbury. The set was too long. There was, it was a deliberate decision of having no interaction with the audience and no talking between songs and Damon would just stay where he was at the keyboard and do his songs and then the guest artist would do their songs and the video would run and then after that the feedback from a lot of people was that we need Damon to be that, talking to the audience and all the rest of it and doing all the pantomime stuff that he does brilliantly not for pantomime stuff but his, all, his, yeah. his, his, his showmanship is just incredible so we needed that back as part of it. And we and we also cut the set down a bit and we thought, let's make the song snappier. And we moved to Ross Kilder Festival after that. And we did that set perfectly and nothing really much changed after that. We had it. We really had it. We, we introduced a few extra songs here and there, but it, it pretty much stayed the same. We had a formula for running it and it worked. I mean, later on, even doing Humans, it was pre it's pretty set. We didn't really change a set a lot. It's very difficult putting a set together. It's so hard. And, and I have to give credit to Stu Lowbridge, who, who does that job so exceptionally well. And it's mm. hard. He comes up with a, a set that has historical context. It also has not just the mood and the build of the set, but it has a relevance of what song goes after what song and the, and the story that's being told. I mean, it's quite an involved process, but he, he does it so well. And, you know, we'll finish the gig. And one of the first things we'll talk about is, did that set work? That didn't feel right, that coming after there, but maybe that should move in a different place on the set. And then we'll try it in a different order. And eventually it's like, well, that really works and it, it doesn't change, you know. What makes Snoop Dogg so good at what he does? Like, it was so interesting watching Glastonbury. He, he was so slick and he's obviously got this kind of vibe, which is very kind of chilled back and relaxed. But I was like, that guy's professional. That guy is totally on it. So I just wonder, having worked closely with him, what, what makes him so good from your kind of vantage point? Well, he's a brilliant rapper. I mean, what else can you say? He's just, yeah. he's just a brilliant rapper. He's a brilliant musician. He's got wonderful sense of music, obviously. He has a great understanding. You know, it's he's a true artist and... He can do anything, you know, and what else can you say? Yeah. I mean, the rappers we've worked with, it's been just incredible. I mean, yeah. So, yeah, rappers are, are, are generally very easy, really. They just know that they're, they're, they're great musicians. They know where they're going to rap and they have it. I mean, George Benson came and <laughs> when we had George Benson come to play with us, you know, he's mm. an unbelievable guitarist. He can do whatever he can, whatever he wants. It's just brilliant. So... Yeah, it's it's really it's it's really uh, your shoulders drop and your all the tension goes away when you have somebody in, who's on stage who just is so at ease with performing. Uh, that's Snoop Dogg, mm. and that's many of most of the people we work with. Let's talk good, the bad, the queen, mm. and Tony Allen. 
really sad news last year that must have obviously yeah. hit, hit you hard yes As I, I know it did a lot of people practically invented Afrobeat, just a, just a legend in his field you know any drummer out there would just you know often cite tony as such a a, a groundbreaking artist you obviously worked with him closely over the last few years with the good the bad and the queen just you know what are your fondest memories um from touring and working with tony oh crikey well i mean so many First of all, obviously, his drumming and his feel and his uncompromising nature of performance and him as an artist and a drummer. I mean, we have to remember, you know, Tony is, was a, a band leader. And talking to him, I was very lucky, actually, when we did Dr. D, which was the opera that Damon wrote, and Tony was in the band then, that two of us shared a, an apartment for two weeks while we were doing the, the show. So every night I was privileged, uh, honoured to have endless stories about his time with Fella and his musical experience and what got him into playing. I mean, it was just extraordinary having these, these, these opportunities. And, you know, as I said, that Tony's a, a band leader and I, I remember talking to him about Art Blakey and the Jazz Messengers and saying, Tony, I just... There's a picture of Art Blakey from sort of the 50s sitting at the drums. And I said, it, it kind of sits like you. He has the same poise on at the kit and the same stance. And, and Art Blakey was a fierce band leader. Uh, I mean, these drummers, have, uh, old Buddy Rich, they have a certain feel about them when it, when it comes from the back, that the engine is in charge of the, of the, of the arrangement. I mean, it, it, everything to do with... The, I know we're going from a slight tangent, but... When you when you look at fella and listen to fella with Tony involved, you know that those arrangements are that way, pretty much because of how Tony structures the groove and drops out or drops the groove or drops or builds the solo and fills and comes down to the groove, and it changes the arrangement. And that is what he brings to to everything that you know he plays. And with the good and the bad and the queen, it's a slightly different fish because you have a a song structure, you have a three and a half or a four minute song that has a verse and a chorus and a bridge. And you have someone like Tony, whose background of groove and, and, and extemporization is a different arrangement. So it's not shoehorning Tony into that format. It's about understanding how you play with that person because you can't compromise when you've got somebody of that nature when you're performing. Tony has to be free. So when we played Maryland, it was it was like doing a jazz gig. It, mm. it, even though we were in a kind of a format of song, it just felt different every time, every night we played the gig. Uh, things would happen slightly differently. Tony would play slightly differently. He would do something slightly differently on, on everything. This is Tony Allen. And it's just this vocabulary of drumming that he, he, he can draw on that was a real education for us. And it just made us, I, I, well, for me, I just, I found myself just sort of in there. And the concentration required to do that show was immense because of the individual styles that are just so strong, you know. And Paul, Paul Simonon's bass playing mixed with Tony's drumming it's a force of nature and with, with Simon added it, it, it was it's uncompromising you know I think Tony's uncompromising if he didn't like playing a certain way he would say it I mean Tony didn't like doing sound checks <laughs> we want to do a sound check I said I don't want a sound check so we'd have to coerce him into well, well the reason we want to do a sound check is because we kind of want to run this song he said I'm fine <laughs> <laughs> I'm fine. I don't need a sound check. But he had a, a very kind and generous nature and a, a peaceful nature and funny as hell and could drink anybody under the bus. <laughs> Did virtually every night, you know. 
you could get involved in a, in a Tony night and you'd have a terrible headache the next day. He had just a lot to, lot to give all the time, just the biggest heart and the biggest player. You know, you're playing with Tony Allen, he's not playing with you. That's kind of the feeling you have when, you, when you're performing with Tony and it's just uh, extraordinary. You know, mm. and if that you're, answer the question. Yeah, it does. I mean, also, I'm, I'm thinking from the perspective of, say, a young musician now um, goes mm. on and becomes a musical director, and you've got this, as you describe, kind of a bit of a force of nature and someone who's been a band leader who they might look up to, uh, and they're saying, I don't want a sound check, but you know that it's best for the band, actually, that there is a sound check. What, what are the ways of coercing people, and how would you deal with that, that, that dynamic? Because it'd be quite easy to go, oh, Okay, Tony doesn't want to, and that's it. But actually, if you know it's for the best of the band, what would you what would you do in that situation? Well, you just have a chat, and you say why it needs we why we need to do it. I mean, it's not belligerence. Tony doesn't have a belligerence about him ever. It's mm-hmm. just that he thinks, well, I think it sounds fine. He said, well, for whoever it might be that for a reason we need to run a song, there are reasons we need to do that, and he just it's just about explaining it, and. Yeah. You know, then, and particularly if you've worked with somebody a long time, you have a friendship and you have a musical understanding and respect for each other. So it's, it's a discussion. It, it, I mean, Tony will have an opinion, but it doesn't mean to say that he's going he's he's to stick to it. It's, it's about coercing, it's about discussing, it's about not bullying, it's about being nice, it's about being understanding, it's about articulating why things need to be done a certain way and why things need to be addressed, why things need to be rehearsed. It's, there's a reason for everything. So, and, and I mean, obviously, if you have a job title as musical director, then nobody can really argue against that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it seems, it seems like, uh, it, it, almost like it doesn't seem appropriate that the good, bad queen carry on without him. You know, it's oh, such know. an integral member. Well, it's I like, know. With, pff, such a difficult one, isn't it? It, it, it? Well, I just can't see us... Well, personally, I mean, how could we how could we do any more without Tony Allen? Mm, yeah, great artist, uh, great great musician. He's left a, a huge musical footprint. Yes, um, with Damon, if someone was to work with Damon for you know, say, a six month period, uh, what would they learn from working with Damon that they wouldn't learn from working with anyone else? Do you think? <sighs> That's a tough question. They would learn about, well, I mean, are you talking about a, another singer? You talk, it depends on the instrument. Ah, oh, interesting. It, it, it would be about not playing anything wrong, playing what's been rehearsed, giving it something, taking your iron knickers off and performing with confidence and belief. Believe what you're performing. Trust yourself. That's Put yourself, I mean, I, I said this before, I, I think Damon puts himself on the line as a performer. He risks things, he works things out, he concentrates, he has a context, he has a perspective. And that's the things you have to do. You're not just singing a song or you're not just playing. There's reason behind the music. There's a story, there's a, there's a foundation, there's a soul. It, it, it's, much, it's a much bigger picture than just performing, you're you're conveying something that means something to somebody. You have to give it. You have to you have to you have to give it, and you have to believe it, and you have to be good, and you have to just be confident. If you if you don't show that, then you 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 could be found out very quickly. So, yeah. If there was a magic way that you could um, be in uh, the audience for one gig that you've ever played, uh-huh. in, the smallest ever gig to like the biggest uh-huh. ever gig, if you could just you know go back and just be in the audience for that gig and experience it as an yeah. audience member, which gig would that have been? Oh, I think I would love to see the Good, the Bad, the Queen. I would have loved to have seen us play uh, at London Palladium on Maryland. I would have loved to have seen us play at Colour Coats when we were doing the warm-up shows for Maryland. Any of those shows, I mean, God, I would love to see us play. I'd love to see, I'd love to see Gorillaz close up. I'd love to watch that show because of the, I'm not just because of the music, obviously, but just the, just the whole visual spectacle, how it look and how it sounds. I'd love to watch a, a Gorillaz show. Which one? I don't know. I think probably somewhere in South America, Mexico uh, or Argentina, because it's completely crazy, the reception we get there. Crowds, Not don't get. Crowds are amazing. And they sing everything. South America, 
when you play a song, they don't just sing the song, they sing all the instrumental bits, they sing everything. You know, if they could sing the drums, they would sing the drums. So just being amongst that audience would be pretty special, that madness. Also, you know, when you see a show, if you, the expectancy, those 15 minutes before the, it starts, that feeling of that tension, you know, that the, you have as an audience man. But yeah, mm. I'd like to see a good show. But I think really I'd like to see the good and bad queen more than anything. <laughs> If you think about a time in your career, and it's, again, this could be at any level, any gig that you ever played, that you felt most euphoric walking off stage, because we do get that, don't you? You come off stage Ooh. and there is that feeling. What's the gig that you felt most euphoric that you can, you're almost flying off the stage? Okay. Well, I think it's a tricky one, but I think, I think our last, our show playing the Greatest Hits tour with Blur when we played Glastonbury, hmm. which was the... Show. The year before? The year gorillas? before yeah. Gorillas, yes. Before yeah, the, right. Yes, that's right. It was the year before. That was, I mean, it, all, the goosebumps were exploding off my off, off me. I mean, it was just incredible. It was just incredible, that show. Walking off. Amazing. What about demoralising then? So the flip of it, uh, what's the time you walked off the stage oh, most demoralised? <laughs> oh, God. Well, I mean, we played, well, there hasn't been many, but there's been some disasters where we had to, we, we got halfway through our first song at a Russian festival in Moscow. I think we got to the chorus of Last Living Souls, which was the first song, and there was an enormous thunderstorm and lightning struck the sound tower. And then we had to stop immediately. And that was a very strange experience because you get this big build up and then you're on stage for five minutes and then before you know it, you're in a van off site. And what's happened there? Demoralising. We played every, Everyday Robots, so Damon's solo project. Just, mm -hmm. It wasn't really demoralising. It was a little bit demoralising because it was South by Southwest and we were late on stage and there would also been as... The crew was setting up our gig. It was when that terrible incident with the guy who drove into the crowd in South by Southwest in Austin. Mm. So we were late on and we didn't play as long as we had. We had to cut the set and we were feeling pretty deflated because we'd heard word of what had happened. Mm -hmm. And all you could hear was sirens. And it was just like, oh, my God, this is not appropriate. This doesn't feel right. So that was not so great. I think losing our losing our bass player on our very first show with Gorillaz in 2000 when we when we went to America and our bass player was arrested on arrival in in, in Canada Toronto as you don't know about that story I could tell you that one uh, he he was taken away for for an offence he committed ten years earlier in the states oh, and they, they waited for him to arrive and they took him away so we lost our bass player so our very first show of our very first tour of Gorillaz in America. And we're down the bass player. So we got in a local bass player and then we got a previous performance of the original bass player down left hand sent over. So our new bass player didn't have to learn the whole set. And it was, I think we were booed actually in Toronto. I think we, we played a very mediocre set. For our staff. What, what did they boo specifically? Was it the it sound quality? Or was it the sound vocal? quality? It wasn't a very long set. We didn't play for very long. I think we played for about 45 minutes. We didn't really have a great deal of material, but mm. yeah, it, it was just not good. We just, we were, we were nervous. So there was nothing there. There was no real oomph in the, in the playing the music. It was just scary. And very enjoyable and deflating. Yes, that, that was probably, if I could think of the, for us as being monumentally disappointing for our standards. Yeah, that, I mean, that, that's the bottom line. It's, the, it's not about audience. It's about you as yourself not feeling good about the show. Mm. Yeah, not good. You talked about audiences in different parts of the world and you played in Syria and Lebanon, mm. I believe. Is that right? I just wonder what the adjustments needed, if any at all, when you play in quite unusual places for Western bands to tour, if there's any individual adjustments or as a, as a production. Not when we toured Lebanon or, or Damascus. We 
we were a bit limited on the screen size, that was all. We had a smaller screen. We played at the Sistel in the middle of Damascus. Yeah, no, nothing. We had our full production with us. We didn't have to cut anything back, just the size of the screens. They were a bit small. <laughs> and and how, how, how did the audience react? Were they familiar amazing. with the material and yeah. stuff? And yeah, 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 yeah. yeah this is the thing. I mean, it is like that. It's, it's quite crazy. I mean, this is the thing you learn about uh, uh, playing that you think, wow, people know our music. Well, of course they do. <laughs> so that's why they come to the show. So, yeah. I've always thought it must be quite, I don't know if you've ever thought this, but let's say there must be a song that you start on keyboards maybe or you yes. trigger something. The fact that you can have that emotional shift at the at your fingertips for like 50,000 people. Like if you were to go back like a few hundred years and explain that someone will, will want to be able to do that, that literally you can change the emotion of 50,000 people at your fingertips. Yes. It's really extraordinary, isn't it? I yes, mean, it is. Sure. Yes, it is. I mean, well, that's blur. I mean, you know, we usually start with girls and boys and I started off. I mean, it's, it's actually a bit, it's terrifying. It's terrifying until you start. And as soon as you start, everything's fine. But you just got to get that eight bars done and then you're all right. How I, because I don't, you know, I just have the tempo in my head. So I start without just how it is. It, it, it's, Yeah. Because the nervy thing is you, nobody, you start and then you get the reaction and then you suddenly think, oh, my God, people are listening to me. <laughs> and that's, <laughs> that's when you get the moment of like, I better carry on with this and the, with the notes in the right order and I think I'll be okay. Well, it's interesting. I watched a bit of the um, one that you played at Hyde Park. I think that was for the Olympics. Was that right? Yes. And, yeah, yes, got yeah. girls and boys there. And it's yeah. true. You just walk on stage and you, you start playing the intro and just like everyone just is like pogo, yeah. you know, just jumping up and down. It's, um, yeah, yeah what, a, what an incredible not power at your fingertips, but just an incredible thing to happen to you that you can literally change someone's emotion on that scale in such a way. That's the yes. power of music, I guess. What's the best perk you've ever had in, in, in the job that isn't just kind of the experiences, but like, have you turned up at like award ceremonies and they said, oh, here's it, have a guitar or anything like that? Or has there been any, ever a perk that you, that you've managed to? A uh, perk. Crikey. Let's think. <sighs> Um, do you know what? I'm going to have to think about that. Wow, what perks have we had? I think police escorts are quite fun. Wow. That's quite rock and roll. I mean, a rock and roll perk is driving the wrong way down the motorway on the wrong side of the road with a police escort with loads of traffic coming towards you with police cars in front getting us wow. to a festival on time after jumping off a private jet. That's rock and roll perk. Uh, as far as freebies, not many. I don't know. I don't have any. I just have sort of tour stuff here and there. What's a, what's a bit of memorabilia maybe that you've got or something that you've kept that if the house is burning down, the family was safe, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, what's the oh, thing you'd grab? Oh, well, I've got a number of bits and pieces. I've got a really nice gift from Red Rocks in America of, 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 of a little sculpture which was very nice to get given when we played the damascus show i got everybody to sign a poster so i've got that i've got i've got the i've got jamie's well it was a birthday present actually from jamie which was very nice he gave me his original pencil drawing of the cover of plastic beach so i've i've got that which wow. is very nice ebay <laughs> no chance <laughs> no chance <laughs> no no so, wow any work this year I might have to sell it but no that's invaluable that's invaluable yeah that's, um, wow uh, nice but, yeah and what about is, is there any project that you or artist that you've said no to that you wish you'd said you'd said yes is there anything that kind of think oh why did I say no to that that's come up at any point in your career oh no actually yes there is uh, Yusuf Islam so oh wow I, I did I did a couple of shows with Yusuf a few years ago on his comeback and we played the Porchester Hall in London and so yeah I I was in his band and I thought and he wasn't planning to do many other shows but the band were incredible he is incredible as a musician and it's like you know you have to pinch yourself you're playing all these incredible songs and it was his first show back so he was just testing the water about whether to come back and, and, and do things. And 
So he had original members that had recorded. He had a guitarist, a couple of people that were in the band who'd, who'd done his original recordings with him. So that was like extraordinary and meeting wow. just these incredible people. And then a few months later, he decided to do some more shows, including two at the Albert Hall. And I couldn't do them. They clashed with gorillas. So oh, that was no. like, I'm having to turn down Yusuf Islam because I can't. Playing Cat Stevens songs as well, right? So that was that playing old, yeah, we're yeah, playing yeah. all of them. We're playing, you know, just playing all of these greats. And I had hey. to give up Cat Stevens. Well, <laughs> You know, that, that, that's just, you know, that's just unfortunate. And but you're playing great gigs with gorillas, but that that's just that's fascinating. We're going to begin to wrap up in a moment. We're going to we've got lots of listeners who are musicians, as I mentioned. Yeah. You're a gifted and celebrated and talented musician, obviously. What bad habits do you have that you would teach a young musician not to do, from either a technical point of view? I don't mean bite your nails bad habits, but actually, like, what are things that you think? Oh, actually, I wouldn't I, I wouldn't advise that. Um, uh, I wouldn't. Play unless you're needing to play. If, if you're in rehearsal, don't play your instrument unless you're playing together. Other people might be talking and it's very tiring when you're rehearsing anyway. And if you've got other people noodling while you're talking, it's infuriating. Don't do that. <laughs> don't be late ever for rehearsals. Don't be cock of the hall. Learn. Just know you're in a very lucky position Whatever you're doing, you are lucky to be playing music and pinch yourself that you're doing it. Yeah. Things that you, you're saying things that you shouldn't be doing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, these are all great bits of advice, but I wonder if you're like, like, do you warm up, if you're playing keyboards, do you warm up your, you know, warm up beforehand or do you go in cold or do you, you know, if you're singing backing vocals or something like that, would you warm up your voice? That kind of yes, thing. Yes, that kind that of thing. If, yes. If you're a singer, you need to warm up your voice. If you're uh, if you're an instrumentalist, a, a horn player or trumpet player, you need to warm up your instrument properly. Mm -hmm. Perhaps have a little run through some bits and pieces before you know. Spend that fifteen minutes before you play focusing, not drinking, not chatting on the phone to your whoever, not texting people. Put the phone away. Put the drink down. Focus on what's happening in the next fifteen minutes. Crucial. So, what else is on the horizon for you coming up, Mike? Well, Dave Roundtree and I had a project that we recorded, I mean, it's nearly 15 years ago now, and it's called The Ailerons. And we finally come back to it and are very determined to get this record finished. We have all the songs recorded. We are now looking at framing the rest of the album and getting it released. Our, our determination is released it this year, and Blur fans are well aware of it. But uh, it is a project that we love very much. We think it's good. We found that the songs don't haven't seemed to age too much. It, it needs a bit of work, but we're proud of it and we want to get it out there. So that will happen, we hope, this year, for sure. Amazing. Okay, last question. We ask this to pretty much every guest who comes on. What fears do you have for the music industry, if any? And how might those fears be addressed? What need would need to change to overcome some of those fears you might have for the industry? Uh, well, my... I think there's a lot of current fears, uh, obviously, through with COVID. But uh, my fear is the devaluing of music through streaming and the, the, the accessibility and, and the ease with which music is being obtained very cheaply. I worry about how music could be become devalued and therefore it's harder for any of us to, to have the career we have. I, I really do feel for hugely, and this is a big thing, Anyway, I mean, it's just more accentuated currently, but for bands that are starting, I think it's it's tough. And I, I, I worry that it's music might become more of a, com seen as a commodity. I worry about it, it, it existing in, in the internet generally and how things are just lose their value. Uh, that's my greatest fear about, about music it is, is it, it's losing its artistry and its value and being just used by corporates. What needs to be changed? What needs to change, do you think? What are the specifics? That well, record companies have got to stop being a cartel. They've got to stop operating like a cartel. They have to They have to be fair to the artists. They need to pay artists far more than they're paying them. They need to rearrange their whole thing with Spotify. They need to, they need to, that needs to be sorted crucially about streaming. Music, the money that's being paid is paltry and only the top artists are winning in terms of streaming. 
artists that are on at the beginning are losing. And so what value do you put on someone who's starting their career? They need to make an income. So that's singularly my biggest fear is that people aren't actually going to be able to do what they want to do because they can't get it off the ground and pay for it. Well said. Well, thank you uh, so much, uh, Mike, for your wisdom, your My guidance, pleasure. your candor, your honesty. <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, you, you, you've been involved in so many amazing uh, projects, you know, uh, throughout your career that are going to be watched and enjoyed for decades and decades to come. So you've definitely left your kind of musical footprint on the world of Western music and actually other parts of the world as well. So we really, really appreciate you being a guest on the Stage of Podcast. My- my pleasure, Chris. It's been great to talk to you and best of luck with all the other podcasts you're doing and, and keep, keep an eye on this, this podcast and other podcasts that Chris is running. They're all fabulous. Good luck with everything. Chris, thanks very Cheers, much. Mike. Cheers, Mike. Cheers, Bye. 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 Bye.